Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Marissa Kozlov and it is great to have you with us for today's eMarketer Tech Talk where we host guests from all areas of media, ad tech and martech. Today, we're talking about the gaming landscape and its advertising opportunities. And I'm so happy to have three very special guests joining me today. So let's introduce them. First, we have Jonathan Troughton, CEO of Frameplay. Jonathan, so nice to have you with us. Likewise, Marissa, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be here too after that crazy travel story you just shared with me. So really glad you're with us. Uh, we also have Arjun Sagal, Vice President of Business Development at Daytonix. Arjun, great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. Great to have you here. Um, and finally, we have David Weisenfeld, Lead Strategist for Media and Entertainment at TransUing. And David, so nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you again, Marissa. So before we get into the great conversation, as well as our panel discussion um, and our live q and I just want to say hello to our audience. We're thrilled to have you in attendance with us. You may have some questions because we have a lot of great data and conversation ahead of us. So anytime you have a question, just submit those in the chat window on the right-hand side of your screen. We will do our best to answer as many of those as possible during the live Q&A in the second part of the show. So keep those coming. We always love to hear from you. All right, we have a great conversation planned, as I mentioned. It's time to get started. David, over to you. Okay, thanks again, Marissa, and thanks to everyone for taking time to join today. Um, we're gonna start out with just a few introductions of our companies. You just were introduced to us. We'll introduce our companies briefly. Um, and you know, if you're like me and you're not a big time gamer, the, the gaming landscape can be a little bit confusing, even you know, intimidating. So we're gonna have a few slides where we're just sort of setting some uh, parameter definitions and providing some updates on the latest in industry insights and opportunities just to kind of get everybody uh, kind of level set. And then we will uh, shift over to, I think, the highlight of our presentation, our panel discussion. It'll feature the three of us uh, uh, answering some key questions that, that uh, are kind of uh, relevant to the industry right now. And then we'll end up hopefully with time for Q&A from the audience. So that's our uh, program for today. And I will... There we go. So just a quick background on TransUnion. I'm TransUnion Marketing Solutions. That's the, the, the division of the company that, that uh, is relevant to us today. You know, uh, you know, we, under our true audience brand, deliver identity services, audience targeting, and analytics that are designed to maximize the value of data-driven marketing. And what really ultimately differentiates TransUnion and true audience solutions from other, uh, you know, uh, uh, products in the marketplace is the scale, accuracy, and depth of our identity underpinnings. Um, they really are best in class. And, you know, since today's really about, about gaming, I should give a, a shout out to our, what's called our True Audience Data Marketplace, which is uh, powered by TransUnion's household graph. And it's sort of specially built for streaming and other household-based activities, which includes uh, console-based and PC gaming. And it's a really unique asset in that um, it syncs over 80 million connected households deterministically to the connected devices in those homes. So a very tight link between homes and devices, which include, again, PC consoles and other devices used for uh, big screen gaming. And in fact, through our partnership with Frameplay, you can activate pretty much any of the 55,000 audiences uh, and segments in the data marketplace to, uh, you know, in the gaming environment, whether it's console based or uh, mobile PC. Um, we also feature mean, uh, various game-specific segments of which Daytonix, we will hear from Arjun, is a provider of uh, a number of those. So the real benefit, again, of, of working with us through for gaming and other streaming uh, uh, types of advertising is you'll get more scale and you'll get more accuracy in reaching the audiences that you are trying to communicate with. Um, Jonathan, you want to give a little intro on, on Frameplay? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I, I think typically to your point, whenever anyone says gaming, there's a, a bunch of different variations. Everyone thinks it's overly complicated. It, it's not. And I, I think as Frameplay, as we started to come into market, we really wanted to get into the, the mind of all the media and marketers who uh, thought it was complicated and make it easy. So we partner with studios, we partner with advertisers, but uh, technology itself gets actually embedded directly into the game experience itself. It's part of the strap tapestry, part of the world. And, and that way it's really a much better experience for the player themselves. So they can, from any, from buyer media perspective, they can go into the premium game experience and they can use our technology to validate what somebody did, what they saw, how they saw it, 
So I guess all of the main sort of metrics you expect in the rest of the marketing ecosystem, those really are present in the games because of us. And uh, you can really expect to see all those similar KPIs. Uh, so I, I think the one big thing to sort of call out about why we really, really wanted to tap this space is because monetization for games was done, in, in my experience, not really for the gamer and not really for the experience that they really go there to experience. And uh, we really wanted to capture that and be able to bring a brand into that experience while they're there. So, you know, I'm really excited to sort of talk through the differences and the difference that Intrinsic brings to the gaming space and how the partnership with uh, TransUnion is so valuable to us to really bring those things and bring those audiences to life in those games. Awesome. And uh, Arjun, a little bit on Datonics. Sure. So Datonics uh, is a digital data company and a pioneer in the audience targeting space. We've got a robust data set that spans all the main verticals and includes search intent, life stage, behavior, B2B, demographic, past purchase, brand affinity. Um, and we were one of the first to be powering DSPs with audience data to do across uh, advanced targeting across channels, including in the gaming environment. Awesome. And of course, Datonics audiences are proudly featured in our true audience data marketplace. Uh, so now it's a little bit on, on the gaming industry and just some level settings, some definitions, things like that. Uh, and uh, Arjun and, 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 and Jonathan, feel free to jump in if I say anything wrong or miss anything. But, you know, good way, really two good ways to divide up the and think about the gaming landscape is by device. And as Jonathan was alluding to, how the, the different games are, are monetized. So you know, first up is it's console games. This is these are games played on dedicated gaming hardware like Xbox and PlayStation, and and you're probably familiar with those. Um, often, you know, connected to a, a home based big screen. So these are home based uh, um, devices. Um, uh, they are monetized, you know, historically by the sales, right? And sales of I mean, retail sales in a in a GameStop or downloading the game and paying paying for that. But a number of other ways to, uh, you know, historically, there are in-game transactions, microtransactions are sometimes called, where gamers can buy certain skills or powers that they can use in the game, um, and they pay real money for those. Um, if you're not a gamer, you might find that surprising, but it's it's, it's a big market. Um, you know, also sales of skins, which sort of change the look of the game, or expansion packs, which can refresh a game without having to buy a whole new game, as or other forms of monetization. And in game advertising for console games, other than sponsorships or, you know, ads that might have been stitched into the game at the time it was being programmed, you know, pretty, pretty much wasn't much of a market until about a year ago. And this is where Frameplay, you know, kind of steps up and does some really cool stuff where the ability to now do what you might call intrinsic or native advertising in games that, you know, ads that appear to be part of the game, but the context of the game and can be varied dynamically targeted so that you and I might be playing the same game at the same time, but I might, you know, be on the East Coast, see an ad for, uh, you know, a, an East Coast restaurant chain. And if you're on the West Coast, you might same time see an ad for West Coast restaurant game and a game in an environment where that ad fits, but we're seeing different things based on different characteristics. Um, so some really exciting things happening in that space um, that, that, that we're working with Frameplay to help to bring to, to life. Um, laptop, desktop, often called PC gaming, kind of similar to console gaming. Again, I'm not a big time gamer, so if I miss anything here, let me you know, jump in. But the well, difference... I, I, I was going to jump in there as well. Go ahead. And actually, and just in. sort of like a, an idea that typically may not be apparent to the, the rest of the world is typically laptop, PC, let's just call it desktop gaming. For all intents and purposes, they tend to be uh, console first. And then it's an extension into that world. So, you know, those two really run parallel and, and very much, I, I kind of wanted to reiterate that point you made before. Like historically, a lot of the technology wasn't available to actually produce the experience that these platforms wanted to deliver to the players. So whenever you saw any ads that were being put in there, it was very hard coded. It was very laborious. And a lot of this old mentality where we're thinking like a lot of people think it's hard to get in there it really did exist because it was hard. It took a long time to get the ad content to be part of the experience that's actually acceptable to the player. And that, without technology being actually brought in there, is a huge shift in that mentality. 
Um, but, but back to your point, like I just want to make sure that connection is that laptop and like sort of PC console, they're all in that same sort of realm and the same Absolutely. expectations are together. Yeah, and those are the kind of the, you know, the immersive games, the games that you, you know, you pay, you know, a decent chunk of money to buy the game and historically in a cartridge or whatever that fits and, and you you go from there. Um, and uh, lastly, is the biggest category actually is mobile games. This is where, you know, lightweight gamers like me kind of, you know, probably uh, stake out our, our ground, uh, you know, words for friends. I'll take on anybody who wants to challenge me. I'll put that out there as an open challenge to all uh, webinar attendees. Um, but this is the largest category, um, you know, monetized most heavily by advertising relative to the other two today, although that, again, likely to shift in the, in the near future. Um, you know, some monetization through buying of games or, or, or in-game assets as well. Um, and these are the kind of things, you know, you'll see people play for five minutes at a time. They have wide variation, but also, and Jonathan could probably speak better than this as well, more and more some of the more immersive games are, are becoming available and being played on these, you know, very uh, yeah. powerful mobile and, devices. I mean, that's a, that's a fantastic jump off point, specifically for mobile in itself. Like if you go back again, historically, the mobile devices really weren't playing games. I mean, unless you're playing Snake, which I loved, uh, you weren't really playing too, something too immersive. But that really, I, I think that's shifted over the last couple of years. And it, you know, to even take like a page out of some of the, the news that we're seeing now, like uh, Apple has spent billions in this latest release of the iPhone 15 Pro to emphasize gaming. They redesigned GPUs to make sure that the, the actual device itself, the phone, can actually play far more immersive games. Now, if that's a nod to anyone, that Apple is spending billions on making sure that the next releases of devices are more capable of spending... A, playing more immersive titles. I think it's a pretty good nod to sort of say where the industry is going, uh, especially given the size of it already. Uh, but yeah, we are seeing more of a parity now between uh, the console all the way to a mobile device. But think again, think of like distance, like a console, somebody sitting in a lounge, somebody sitting at home, <laughs> very different distance. So screen size starts to not matter as much. Absolutely. Uh, so in terms of, you know, how games are played, we sort of alluded to this already, you know, I think that a real key point here is that, you know, gaming isn't uh, a, a niche thing by any stretch. I mean, it's mainstream activity. Majority of people play some games. Certainly some audiences are more engaged and, and more, more uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, expert gamers than others. But uh, in terms of, you know, uh, if you look at the, I think of it from a penetration standpoint, you see mobile is much larger or the combination of mobile and, and tablet, if you want to put that together, mobile phone and tablet, much larger uh, than than the other segments. But but they're also large. You have nearly 100 million people, you know, playing on PCs or, or consoles. Um, and revenue wise, and there's a lot of there's some differences in the numbers that are out there depending on what's counted and what's not. But in terms of total revenue, you know, about a hundred billion dollars or half of it is tied to mobile. About 30 percent or 60 billion, more or less, in the U.S tied to console and about 20% tied to uh, PC. So it's kind of 50-50 between that console PC universe and the mobile universe, uh, as Jonathan kind of was explaining a moment ago. Um, but gaming is very much mainstream activity. And, you know, when you talk about gamers as a segment, well, you're really kind of talking about everybody. You got to get a bit more specific than that if you really want to start to segment uh, and get into the specifics around, you know, who's playing games. Um, and so, you know, we see that gamers is, are not just men, but by any stretch, about half of the audiences for gaming is women. Um, it's certainly true that some of the more hardcore gamers, those 18 to 24 year old men who as a group actually spend more time gaming, even including those in that group who don't play games, just as a holistic segment, 18 to 24 year old men spend more time playing games than they do watching television, give you a sense of the development of the category. Um, the average time playing spent really took a jump up during the pandemic, but like a lot of other uh, home-based entertainment, such as streaming television, didn't really come back down very much when the pandemic ended. So people sort of took that time to almost discover new ways to consume entertainment. And when they discovered that they liked those new ways, they they stuck with them. And, and we're still seeing, you know, very high engagement in terms of hours per game or continuing, uh, you know, post-pandemic. Um and uh, uh, yeah, I think that that was really all. Anybody else want to add anything to the, the who side of the, the gaming equation here? 
I mean, I I always jump in on all these things, but uh, the, uh, I guess it it always comes back to, and and I, I probably will reiterate this many times during this conversation, because as every media buyer planner on this call, you probably can understand is the education is always the hardest with new channels and so forth. And there's all these sort of misconceptions, but the amount of people on who play games, like right now, you're probably saying, oh, I'm not a gamer. Well, you probably do play games. So when you start thinking about games as being a mainstream channel and start understanding that there's much as much time going into video games as there is anywhere else, you don't really think gamers. You think just people who play games and people who play games, like on the other slide, on different types of devices. And, uh, you know, much to Dev's point, that, that's only ex- ex- expanding and growing. Right. And and having said that while gaming is mainstream, there are certainly segments of gamers that a marketer may want to reach. It's this kind of stuff that Daytonix does where, you know, if, and I don't know exactly these segments you have, but we're talking about, you know, heavy gamers or or people who play certain kinds of games. Um, those audiences may be relevant to reach for various marketers. You know, gamers are an interesting group in and of themselves. I mean, even the 50% who do game, you know, there's some differences. I mean, they they tend to be more heavily technically or technologically forward, if you will. They're heavier streamers of TV, heavier users of streaming audio versus the radio, um, just more technically savvy in general, tend to be higher income. There's a number of things about gamers in general, but you know, there's also certainly groups within that that are targetable that may be of interest uh, to you, depending on what your marketing agenda is. Yeah, sure. I, I can add to that. Datonix has done yeah. some research on the audience profiles uh, for consumers that play games. And what we found is they really span the engagement spectrum in four main buckets. The first is the leisure gamer or the just for fun gamer. This is the casual player who plays online in their free time um, on average about three to five times a week. Um, And then in the second bucket, we have what we call the smartphone gamers and they play in bursts on their phones. And this audience includes teens, adults with kids, and even the older audience, um, including baby boomers, uh, would fit in that bucket. Then in the third bucket, um, we have what we call the passionate gamers. This audience skews males, but includes some females as well. And these folks um, are heavily engaged. Um, They'll freely spend money on games for upgrades and higher rewards. Um, the age demo is typically 18 to 25, and they have um, online friends through social connections and also participate in the streaming ecosystem. And these folks typically spend three to four hours gaming um, daily. Um, and then finally, in the fourth bucket, um, we have the competitive gamers uh, who are often nationally ranked. They play in competitions. Um, They play as a part-time job or even a full-time job. They win prize money based on performance. Um, And this audience is about 70% male and uh, may have sponsorships and typically are engaging in this environment over 40 hours a week. Wow. Sounds like a, yeah, kind of a cool job if you're good enough to to, to, to get there. Um, So this is our last slide in terms of kind of setup, uh, you know, uh, the headline the U.S. video game advertising market is well-developed, but yeah, maybe take a little bit of issue with that. I think it's going to become more developed and become well-developed. But, you know, today, the most developed uh, sort of segment of gaming is the mobile segment, um, about $6.5 billion in advertising. You know, that compares to, you know, over $80 billion in television if you add streaming and linear TV together. So, you know, not 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 necessarily, uh, you know, up to that to that level. You know, globally, uh, you know, about about a third of advertising in the gaming is, is spent here in the U.S. Um, that's not that different than we see, in, for example, television in the same about similar ratio. Um, what's interesting is that, you know, part of the reason gaming isn't as developed is that these interstitial ads, these interruptive ads, a typical TV commercial pod, um, doesn't really work in gaming, as Jonathan was, was explaining earlier. You know, in the gaming environment, gamers are, you know, just the nature of that engagement and that entertainment Gamers insist on the ads that occur in gaming to not be interrupted with the experience, but to really have to fit into that experience, almost be part of the game, maybe ideally even enhance the game um, to be able to uh, for them to accept it. Well, it, it, it's engaging. I think I think the one right. thing to jump out here is like 
they're engaged. They're not doing something Absolutely. Else. completely part of the experience. You know, whether or not it's the right thing to do, but like, if you're watching TV and you walk away, the show keeps going. If you're playing a game, especially if you're playing online with your friends and others, which most gaming is heading towards, well, it doesn't really stop. You, you can't just hit pause and everybody stops. You actually will probably lose the game. Whatever. So people are very, very engaged. And to that point, I, I think there's a different expectation on the experience that they have. So when you're starting to think about experience and people are there for a good time, they're choosing to spend very, you know, out of every day, you only have 24 hours a day. And the amount of time that they're choosing to be playing games because it makes them happy, like you really do have to think about the experience and make sure that the experience for the actual player is what they expect. And that's why I was seeing such a, an uptick in the intrinsic side of this. Absolutely. And, and I don't know if you have, if you'd, uh, you know, we can save this for the panel discussion, but, you know, in my opinion, just having from a, more of a marketer's perspective, you know, I think the technology required to deliver these ads in the way that a marketer would like to, but also is accepted to the to the consumer in that environment has been kind of lacking until, you know, companies like Frankly are now enabling that to happen. And so that 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 sort of asset you have, your video ad or whatever, it needs to be no doubt adjusted somewhat to fit the game, but you can start to advertise in the way you're used to in these games, um, you know, an audiovisual environment where the audience is highly engaged, yeah. very uh, attractive to advertisers, but in a way that the, that the I consumer mean accept. To, to that point, that's why the IAB has spent so much time in actually defining, categorizing, making sure it's really clear, like, what are you actually getting? Is it intrinsic or is it something else? Measurement standards, you know, the measurement stands for viewability are completely ratified now for gaming. So like, it's consistently being standardized uh, from a channel that's growing and, and the amount of time that people are spending in here. It's like the whole emphasis we've had as always is like, hold the line for the actual player, make sure that the average person who is choosing to spend their time there is not going to have their experience deg degraded. And then let's align the rest of the industry to this and make sure we actually accept, you know, the industry, especially in advertising, has a lot of this stuff established for very good reasons. And how can we accept all of these, but also respecting the player? Absolutely. And I lied a moment ago. That was the last industry oversight chart that I had. I think, uh, you know, Jonathan, if you want to talk to these next couple, uh, and, you know, anything we didn't touch on, you know, feel free to, to jump in. These are some great slides from Frameplay. I mean, th these are great sides. I know TransUnion as a partner has also been uh, ex excellent from actually bringing these things to light and actually allowing our clients to be able to see these sorts of details around what's actually and who the audience is and who is actually inside of these games. But I, I think there was a there was a saying that um, basically gaming is as diverse as the human race. I think <laughs> that is a really good uh sort of just point just take that as it is and then have a look at data that you know partners uh, like Daytonics or a transunion can actually activate inside of our ecosystem yeah oh this is a well yeah I, I think this is you said something earlier as well I think it's probably a good call out is COVID I think a few people have had this conception that basically COVID spurred gaming it didn't not at all maybe it gave the world a moment, especially in the media landscape, to take a break and pause and have a look at what is actually happening. Uh, and that at that point, there was a lot of attention put onto, speaking of attention, we'll definitely talk about attention, but uh, there was attention put on gaming. And from a people who play games perspective, again, this is not a new channel. It's, it's well established. Uh, and from that point, you know, we'll, we'll dive into a bunch of other bits and pieces, but if you're looking at growth from 2022, and we're not talking about you know 2020, 2021 growth in gaming, 2022 like it's 16.4 percent growth. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of things moving into the gaming channel. Absolutely, well, great stuff. Thanks, Jonathan. And now we're going to pass it back to uh, Marissa, who's going to uh, facilitate the much eagerly anticipated panel discussion. Well, thanks so much, David. I've been already enjoying hearing the three of you talk already. So, um, you know, a, a few slides ago, you shared so much great audience, uh, you know, statistics, talking about the demographic makeup, almost an even split between male and female, the amount of time they spend playing games. So really to help our audience prioritize their efforts, what's the most important thing that advertisers need to know about the value of this audience that you described? Um, Jonathan, what are, what are your thoughts and recommendations for this? Um, well, I probably belabor this 
constantly, but uh, beyond the attention and like lean in, like they can't lean out, they, they have to be part of it. Um, the frame play and trans union partnership really reinforces that uh, you, you shouldn't say gamers, it's just people who play games. And I think the segments that Daytonics and TransUnion actually bring to light really illustrate that more and, and re-emphasize that. And if you're looking for you know different interest segments, music, sports, et cetera, um, you know, you can really find that. And, and the majority of uh, you know, for instance, the majority of the frame play network, people own their cars. I mean, they donate more money uh than the average American does. They you know, they vote, they do all these sorts of things. So, I mean, I definitely could throw that over uh, to David Arjun to sort of speak to more as well. But um, yeah, I think in general. Yeah, I mean, I think, oh, go ahead, Arjun. I was, I was just going to say that um, gaming represents a vast source of inventory from an advertising perspective. And historically, you know, it, it wasn't... Um, didn't have the monetization uh, potential that we're now seeing. Um, and you can do all kinds of advanced, you know, targeting capabilities beyond contextual now, um, leveraging intent and, and audience data in the gaming environment. Yeah, and I would just add, uh, you know, we did some work at TransUnion a couple of years ago on attention and engagement to the advertising in different mediums. We didn't get into gaming per se, and you really, you know, wasn't a lot available at this just even a couple. Well, years we've ago. got a lot now, and then I, got a lot now. And I'm it's not going to make this about attention, otherwise, the next three hours are gone on the methodologies, like how good computer vision is that we have built into the technology of every single experience. Uh, but yeah, other than that, I'm going to keep plugging. So sorry to hand that back to you. But no, I was going to say, I mean, it, it, everything suggested the more that you know this was even streaming television, the more that the consumer is choosing what they want to watch. The more targeted the ads are, the, the the sort of less interruptive they are, all of which are, are features of streaming television advertising relative to linear, the yeah. more the, the audience pays attention. Gaming takes that just to another level, right? I mean, you're you know, you're talking about game, you know, ads that are stitched into the games that are, you know, absolutely reaching a, a very thoroughly, there is no game without the player, the thoroughly engaged the audience and and you know, these games just feel like they're part of the landscape that that the consumers immersed in. So you know, we would expect that attention would be sort of off the charts. And, and, you know, so on a CPM basis, right, if you're getting, even if you're paying more and you're not necessarily doing that, uh, you know, you're going to get more attention and more more uh, recall and, and action off of a gaming ad than, than a similar ad in a different medium in many cases. Well, if, if I can leave you with anything on the attention side of things, look into intrinsic time and view. Uh, we have done a lot of research around this. There's standards now that are being put out around this. Uh, but intrinsic time of view is definitely something that you want to double click on and I can, people can definitely reach out about that if they wish. Okay. Thank you for all of your perspectives on that one. David, you brought up some uh, KPI metrics like CPM uh, just, just now. So I'll ask you, how important is advertising for video game revenue? I think it's become a lot more important. I mean, as we talked about, you know, it's important today for mobile in particular. It's a big chunk of the component of the, the revenue for that, that, that type of game, that, that domain. Um, but now that the technology is available to be able to do in-game advertising the way that gamers want to do it and the way that marketers want to do it and the way gamers will accept it, you know, I expect advertising to become a much more significant chunk of the uh, the 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 way that console and PC games are are monetized. I mean, we've constantly seen other media that you know consumers are willing to accept, despite sometimes common wisdom, happy to accept advertising that's relevant and meaningful um, in, in exchange for paying less for a gaming title, for example, or a subscription to a gaming service. Um, you know, we see that very much happening in the TV landscape now, right? A lot of kind of a subscription fatigues, they call it, with uh, all these uh, streaming video on demand services that charge to watch. People will accept and we see much faster growth among the ad supported side of streaming. And I think that's gonna be a good, uh, sort of a forecast, if you will, for what's going to happen with gaming, where once the ad format is is able to be rendered in the right way in these games, you're going to see more advertising and maybe people paying a little less for the titles, but more of that monetization going toward the into the advertising bucket, if you will. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I can even give like slight extensions to that as well, maybe on the flip side. Historically, you didn't really have like games when they first originated that the set models, if you're paying for things up front, the game doesn't really even get updates or was shipped as it is. Consistently as we went, we had uh, live operations, servers, data centers, etc. So the incremental cost keep increasing. However, like the interest in the audience uh, was obviously also increasing. People wanted to be able to reach gamers, but how do you do that without breaking the experience? And that was the blocker, like frame play coming in, providing the technology to actually bridge that experience expectation. I don't necessarily think we'll see games necessarily being cheaper. They may be free altogether, but that de desire to get into that audience is actually just possible now that the game studios are willing to entertain it. Whereas before they're like, no, oh, we're good. We already make a lot of money. We do want to make more because costs are going up. But to Dev's point, like the technology is enabling that. That's what Frameplay is really good at. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Well, you know, we know that gamers and, and consumers are not only in one place at one time, they're they're in many different places. So um, the term omni-channel comes up very frequently. How is gaming a part of an omni-channel strategy? J Jonathan, what do you think about that? Uh, well, again, I beat this point. Um, gaming is a huge, very engaged audience. You know, they're undivided attention, they're having fun. I, I think one thing to really think about is this is not a test channel. You have 290 million Americans to have access to the internet and 215 million of them play games. I think that's a pretty, you know, call out statement. Like it's not a test channel anymore. And when you start looking at like the value that this channel actually brings in, you start looking at a game, like intrinsic time of view and the value that you're actually getting for your dollar versus other channels. Not a, It's not a test channel. Like it should be part of an omni-channel plan. Uh, and this is where you really come into, and you know, thanks to partners like TransUnion and Daytonics as well, they can actually activate these audiences so you really can get more inventory moving and get really good data and targeting and understanding. And obviously, gaming wasn't a cookie-less, you know, it wasn't a cookie-enabled environment. It was cookie-less from the get-go. Um, so you now you're thinking of contextual and all these other elements that you're really looking at the whole world is moving towards. Gaming's not a channel. Intrinsic, especially, is not a test channel. Yeah, and I'll just add through platforms like the data marketplace and others. You know, you can you can um, you can be consistent in targeting the same people across channels, or purposely choosing not to. But you can activate audiences, the same audience that you might activate for uh, you know, say, streaming television and connected TV. You can activate that audience in ga in game, and uh, so you can expand your reach. You can maybe give a different message if you want to in that environment to, uh, you know, further your your uh, connection to the consumer. But all of that is now feasible and gaming isn't this thing that sits out here like, oh, it's, you, know, you convinced me it's worth looking at, but how do I stitch it together with the rest of my plan? Well, it's very, very integratable, if you will, uh, with other with other media. All right. So, you know, Jonathan, in thinking about gaming not being a test channel, what recent changes have had a positive impact on in-game advertising for, for spending in particular? Uh, education, uh, frankly, it comes down to education going back over and over and over. And that this sort of like, and I think everybody here in the media space understands like how and where people got to. And if those people who are signing off on things or playing is they're like, well, I don't play games or I don't play a lot of games or I don't consider myself a gamer, which is the irony in all these things. Uh, that's typically where it gets to. Plus, you've got all the expectations, like, you know, a lot of the legacy channels need to be looked after and so forth. But, you know, if you really want true innovation, you want to actually have high performing media that actually does better than anything else. you got to go into that space. So education. Uh, but to that point, uh, you know, the pipes, the pipes weren't there at how they needed to be in the past. So that's completely understandable. It's taken this long to get to the point where we can actually activate this way. The pipes are there now. Um, so, you know, checks and balances, whether it's, you know, measurement, IBT, all, all this stuff, it, it's really coming of maturity now. Uh, but again, I, I think it comes back to education and the fact that people spent eight hours a week playing games and, you know, where else are they doing these sorts of things or more? Um, I don't know. And, and, and game partners like the Tonex and uh, TransUnion and being able to activate these audiences and find these audiences and understand them and actually contextualize it back to the media buyer. 
Uh, and that's definitely something that Ajahn and, and David can speak to as well. Yeah, I, I would add to that. That's a great point. Um, with the evolution in the ad tech capabilities and the platform capabilities, such as with TransUnion, Frameplay, and Daytonics, I think the gaming environment is a great branding mechanism because you can do um, all of the high impact ads, video, but you can serve and target them with precision now programmatically and apply the relevant contextual signals along with all the audience and intent signals as well um, to really get that um, advanced engagement and impact within this channel. All right, so before we get to the live audience q and I'm just gonna ask you all for a quick response to this last one. What should advertisers keep their eye on for gaming in the next one to three years? Arjun, you wanna go first? Yeah, I, I think we're going to see um, a lot more integrations. I think Frameplay's done a great job bringing a lot of these uh, leading games into the inventory pool um, to then have monetization and give advertisers and brands access to those audience. So I think we're going to continue to see more and more um, new games and gaming companies uh, coming into the space to make their inventory available for, for brands and advertisers. Yeah, I would just say I would keep an eye on the programmatic market. I think there's going to be a lot more gaming inventory available programmatically through whatever you know DSP or uh, you, your your you you choose, and and I think we'll start to see some uh, activity happening, more activity in the the esports and sort of game game watcher market. Those you know esports is you know sort of the competitive gaming game watchers are just people who sort of play games and people watch them because they're really good and they learn tips about how to succeed in the game. But both of those, you know, some of those channels are starting to get to the mass now where they are attracting the attention of advertisers. And uh, I think we'll see more of that opening up as well. I think another area of growth is going to be around audience insights and analytics. Um, Daytonics um, has some great products in that um, area and so does uh, TransUnion. And I think the ability to shine more light on who's actually playing the games, who's participating in the community, you know, what, what are deeper insights about um, those groups? And, you know, maybe they're not, um, you know, signed into a game, you know, what else can you uh, learn about them? So I think the whole analytics and insights um, can offer a lot of uh, value for advertisers as well. I think mine's probably gonna be a little bit different to everybody else's. I was going to say culture. Uh, we've gone through like a paradigm shift as far as culture goes, especially when it comes to gaming. Um, you know, for, for the most point, you know, we heard very early, you know, at the start of this, we heard the comments like, isn't this 15 year old boys in the basement? That statement itself, like irritates anyone beyond belief in here. This culture has shifted significantly since when that statement was probably true was probably 30 years ago. Um, and the cultural shift that we've had from there, and if you look at cultural shift in any other se sectors, just in daily life, you can understand how this applies here as well. So, you know, to that point, the average age of a gamer in the US is 35 and female, that culturally wouldn't have been relevant. But now to be culturally relevant, to have brands relevant, like if you think that the stat before, like 290 million Americans have internet access and 215 million of them play games, if what to look out for is that gap is going to be closed very soon. So if you don't have a very strong intrinsic gaming channel that's like planned, that's plugged into your Omni channel, I think that, you know, you're going to be having to look out to not being relevant. So uh, yeah, cultural shift is probably one of the biggest things to look out for. And, um, you know, to that point, if you really want to understand the culture and how it applies from a data perspective, partnerships like uh, the Daytonics and TransUnion ones are the ones how you activate that culture. All right. Well, thank you all for your perspectives on what everyone should be thinking about over the next few years. Our audience has also been very active in the chat today. So let's get to the live audience Q&A because I want to make sure we we get to some of their questions that they've been uh, sending in to us. Uh, the first one is, what opportunities exist for reaching consumers who are watching gamers as entertainment? David, what are your thoughts on this one? Well, as I mentioned, I think, you know, it, it, first of all, it's shocking to me that that's something that people do. It's like, you know, how, you know, playing a game seems like entertainment enough. And now there's sort of this meta kind of entertainment of watching those who play the game. 
uh you know but but that's a thing and uh, you know i tell you that there's a couple of kids who come in the office here who are you know, kids and folks who work with us and uh they turn on the tv that's what they that's what they're watching they're watching other people playing playing uh you know whatever the game is uh you know uh I, and so i think that's a growing opportunity i think uh you know these are uh people who are watching this or are engaged not only in gaming but again you know I think it's going to be an opportunity to figure out more about those audiences, what really appeals to them. And it could be a great way for advertisers to reach them in, in an environment where they're highly engaged and there's limited clutter uh, today. I, I mean, so David, like to that point, like if you played football and you watch football now, if you played games as a child and you are now watching people play games, it comes to cultural shift, like things yeah. that are fundamental to somebody's upbringing, they shift. And as, you know, the U.S. becomes even more and more diverse. We're going to see more and more of this, like gaming being embraced as just sport. Yeah, and there's competitive gaming leagues with 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 real teams that that people root for. That's separate and apart from yeah. streaming the expert gamers. This esports is is yeah. definitely a thing already. All right. Thank you all. So uh, we had a, a few people ask us a version of this question um, in the chat. So I will I'll bring it all together in one. Um, Jonathan, as privacy is increasingly being regulated, have you found gamers are more open to sharing their data? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily characterize it that way. Um, gamers can be really fickle. Like they go one way or the other. I mean, if you looked at just recently, what Unity did with price increases for runtime versions of Unity, which, you know, Unity has a massive cost of providing an amazing service for, in my opinion, for very little. And, you know, some gamers want to, like, absolutely club me for saying that. But the reality is they're getting a great service for underpriced, in my perspective. Should they have gone out the way they did? Maybe not necessarily. But if you see it the way they reacted to that, is you tend to find that same reactions in the gaming space. And this is also why we've emphasized so much on the experience itself. So when it comes to privacy, I, I think the reality is, is they want to make sure it's legal. Like, is this being done the right way? And if this is being done the right way, and this is the way the legality is saying, I, I would say most gamers are really just stand up for what's right and what they think is, you know, just. It's, to that point, if it's, if it's that actually being developed, deployed, and built to what the requirements are, they're not really going to have an issue with it. Are you going to go and blatantly ask them for like above and beyond information about themselves and throw it in their face and make them feel like it's a really bad experience? Yeah, I wouldn't do that. Okay, well, good to know. Uh, we have another data question, uh, Jonathan, so I'll, I'll tag this onto it. What data sharing is happening with owners of console platforms? Um, aren't consoles like Xbox basically a walled garden uh, with ID and player profile info? Uh, sorry, was that directed at me or? Uh, yeah, because I think you were talking about uh, data sharing before. So this is kind of a follow-up question asked by another member of the audience today. Yeah, look, again, each each publisher to that point and then mm. again to the actual first party providers, they have different requirements, policies in different regions um, as to how much they want to share. I, I could say that they could share more and i've encouraged them to i'm not saying give away everything god no i'm not saying that but I, I think there's some give and take here especially in the gaming community and this is what i've also tried to sort of bring to that is you know sometimes you know a lot of people especially in the game community characterize the requirements and ask from the advertising and media side as being just egregious like too far but the reality is a lot of those are for very good reasons and they actually provide a lot of value to those publishers so if you can bring that same concept and you bring that back to the actual publisher so they in, in in a way that could be digested that they could understand that value and then actually present it and enable it in a way that doesn't feel like people are just being leveraged left right and center um that actually works really well uh to say that that is an easy path it, it's not and it tends to be different from from studio to studio at that side of the console level uh, but not necessarily everywhere else. Plus, also the pipes were different. So I, I think to avoid me getting into some crazy technical conversation, if anyone wants to have that conversation, I know that the TU team can very easily speak to it in an educated manner, and so can we. So I'm more than happy to take that else, but I will burn everyone's time if I... <laughs> I mean, the short answer is, you know, that, 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 you know while, uh, you know, companies like T, we don't collect PII about gamers. There are signals that are emitted by these devices. They're not cookies. 
But if you can get those signals and attach that device to a household, and you know it's all done anonymously, of course, then you have other consumer data sources that describe attributes of that household, also anonymous, with no PII. Put those together, you can say, well, you know, I don't know who lives in this household or anything like that, but I, but I know that these are some characteristics of people who live in that household, and this gaming console is part of that household. So, you know, you can reach, you know, consumers with these characteristics by targeting this household or rolling up a bunch of households that are like that household and and, and achieve a mass with an audience, you know, through gaming that you're trying to reach without any privacy uh, violations or really any, any, any PII at all involved. And, and I think as well, it's good to call out like that prior question, like, and I sort of went to like how game people who play games typically, and not, not the whole audience, but there is definitely a group that like to call these things out immediately and be very loud about them. So, you know, and we always have to think about from a game perspective, it's not just the US, we have many, many jurisdictions and uh, things to actually take into account. And it goes back to just do the right thing and then people are happy. All right, well, we have time for one more question today. Um, Arjun, I'm gonna pass this one to you. For those in the audience uh, who have not placed advertising investment yet with this gaming audience, how can they get started? Well, I think a great way to get started is you can leverage Datonics data and custom segments to effectively reach the right audience in the right environments in the TransUnion platform and on Frameplay inventory. All right. Well, thank you. I covered it all there. Yeah, thank you so much to Jonathan, Arjun, David. Uh, it was so wonderful to be with you here today. Uh, thank you for the great presentation, the panel discussion, and also for answering all of the questions from our audience. It was wonderful to be with you. So just before we wrap up today, I'm going to take a moment to tell you what's happening across eMarketers media channels. Uh, first, mark your calendar for Friday, November 3rd for Attention, our half-day live virtual summit focused on trends and predictions for 2024. So registration is now open on our events page, so please check that out. Um, also, for other uh, upcoming live analyst and Tech Talk webinars, you can go to emarketer.com slash webinars to register. On the audio side, we have a great daily podcast called Behind the Numbers, which you can find everywhere you listen to your podcasts. And please check out our other various newsletters. You will also be getting an email with the link to today's recording. Uh, so finally, thank you all for your time. Thanks again to Jonathan, Arjun, David, and the team at TransUnion. And of course, our Studio II crew, which is our production team behind the scenes, uh, who've all made this webinar possible today. We'll see you all on the next Tech Talk.